Hello and welcome to Teal House Farm. Today we're very excited to be a part of a collaboration. It was put on by the Squeaky Tree Homestead. We're going to be talking about how to start a homestead in 2022. If you're new here, my name is Laura. This is Sam. We are homesteaders on a 10 acre homestead in central Missouri. We have six kids ranging in ages from almost nine down to uh, seven months old. And we have been homesteading on our uh, acreage for about six years now. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started and let's talk about how we would start a homestead if we were starting over in 2022. to start anew. <laughs> if you could start over knowing what we know now, we knew it then. Though I would say, I think a lot of things on our list, um, we would have still done the same. I think we've done yeah. some good things, but there's definitely some things that we would have done differently, and that's what we're gonna talk about. But we are going to give two options. The first is your um, broker than a joker option. It's for starting to homestead where you're at, um, if you don't have money to invest in just picking up everything and moving, which is probably most people, how you can start on your homestead journey tomorrow. And then the second option, we'll call it phase two, it's when you got a little bit of money to put in and you want to move and find some land and things like that, what we would do. Does that sound good? Yep, let's do it. Don't forget, by the way, to check out the links below to all the other wonderful channels involved in this collaboration. And thank you again to Squeaky Tree for inviting us. We really appreciate it. So option one, let's talk about how to turn your disposable money into homesteading where you're at. And by disposable money, I mean A, either money that you're spending on extra fun things that you could cut out of your budget and then turn into investments into your homestead dream, or literally your disposables money and to start saving money by stop using disposable products. So then you can then take the money that you're saving by not buying those disposable products and invest that into your homestead future. So these are very low cash investments um, to help learn new skills and get started on your journey. So the first step is to look in your trash can and do an inventory of what's in there and figure out what things are disposable items that you are throwing away, just throwing away that money every day and how you can replace them tomorrow so that you have to so that you no longer have to keep buying those items and bringing them back into your house. Yeah, you'd be surprised if you do an inventory or trash can, what pops up and you'll, you'll see things in there pretty quickly that uh, you can make a lifestyle change and start saving some money. And this, this kind of stuff, it's not gonna save you, you know, hundreds of dollars a month, but you know, $5 here and $10 there, it can all add up and it can get you started on kind of a, a smaller homestead adventure. So I'll link a video below we did about seven no waste products we use in our kitchen. Everything from no longer buying sponges to using cleaning rags. Um, so you can watch all of those ideas. Some other real simple things is to trade in any disposable diapers and wipes for cloth diapers and cloth wipes. And you do not need to buy the really expensive cloth diapers. A flour sack towel will do you great. I um, also have a video on how to use a flour sack t uh, towel for a diaper. So for less than $50, you can diaper a child from newborn to potty training to toddlerhood um, without spending another penny. Um, what are some other places other than the kitchen? What, what sort of disposable products have well, we stopped using? I don't know that I would say disposable products, but if you're talking about disposable income, I would say like eating out. Mm -hmm. If there's any kind of, whether it's fast food or, you know, sit down restaurants, if you can cut out eating out and pack lunches wherever you go, that's a great way to save money as well. So take that money that you're saving, even if it's only, you know, $40, $50 a month, and go ahead and start investing it into things to get you started on your homestead journey. I think the most important one from my perspective is getting yourself some canning equipment. Get yourself a middle of the road pressure canner. I um, really like my Presto 23 quart. It's a great canner, it's an e intermediate. It's about $150, so it's not gonna totally break the bank, but it's not like those fancy schmancy $500 canners. 
Um, I'll link it below, but it's a great way to get started on your pressure canning journey so that you can start putting food away for your family. Yeah, you want to start learning new skills now, even though you might not be able to have a hundred acre farm and be able to do all the really big things you can work you know uh, in small ways and make mistakes in small ways now and you know eventually if you do get you know a, a big homestead you'll you know how to do everything so i think central to the idea of homesteading is just the idea of sustainability so producing less waste and doing more for yourself and so much of that can be done wherever you live even mm -hmm. if you're in the middle of a city um, doing your own canning um, can help you be able to purchase products that are not wrapped in plastic or in cans that you can't recycle um, and then you can you can take those products you can put them up kind of freeze time and put them up for years um, in a shelf stable way and they just have to sit on your shelf they don't need electricity to keep them cold or anything like that and then they're ready to go when you need them so it's really a very good first step to take learning learning the ropes for canning and uh, i recommend the website um the National, I think about this, National Center for Home Food Preservation here in the United States is a free, great resource. Um, it's how I learned to can. I did not have anybody teach me. I had to teach myself, and that is a great place to get started. Uh, I think the next step along with canning is gardening. Uh, they kind of just piggyback on top of each other, but you can garden anywhere. Even people in apartments can use uh, pots and things like that to start just a, a small little garden. And that's another one of those things where you can build, uh, start building your skills small mm -hmm. and where it might, not, might not matter that much. And then in the future when you're going to homestead big and you know that a lot of your food's going to come from your garden, you'll be excellent at it. And so I, I would suggest starting a garden ASAP. Yes, even if you do not have a lot of room, um, there are lots of types of tower gardens. We have one that's mm -hmm. called the Green Stock Garden, growing strawberries in it. And you're going to use your vertical space instead of your horizontal space to grow a lot of food. And if you do happen to have a lawn and would like to start a garden, um, grow veggies, not grass. Because grass is just annoying, right? you yeah, got to cut it anyway. <laughs> uh, and there's lots of options. Even if you live in a neighborhood where you know you got kind of nosy neighbors in an HOA looking over your shoulder, there are lots of beautiful setups with raised beds that you could really get started with. Just very small, either just one or two, and be able to grow a small amount of produce for your family to learn how to garden. So like Sam said, if you ever do get out on more land and grow a huge garden, you've got some of those skills under your belt. You know about the vegetables that you like to grow. The other positive of gardening is it can be really, really cheap to start. I mean, just ten dollars or less you know you can you can start maybe even cheaper than that if you actually have land but mm -hmm. you know just a couple five gallon buckets and some soil you can grow a few things in that it doesn't really cost that much a lot of these things to start out and try yes very very true um, and another thing you want to start wherever you're at start thinking about bulk food storage so homesteading and prepping are not the same thing but they kind of come hand in hand because when you're talking about doing more for yourself, just being more prepared, things like that. You get into the realm of needing to store. Okay. Our kids are... <laughs> Part of homesteading is just that idea of being more prepared um, and also being able to buy things in large quantities helps to lower the price and it also usually helps you to choose more sustainable packaging like paper packaging. Mm -hmm. And you may be thinking to yourself, gee, I have a tiny pantry in my house or my apartment. I can't bulk store anything. Um, but you'd be amazed what people can do when you really get around to it. Food storage is incredibly important. You know, you have to have food. Um, and so I've seen people use closets and bedrooms. I've seen people add shelvings to like a guest room or an office to store their food. No, it's not hidden away in a pantry, but you're going to be thankful for all that food if there ever should be some sort of natural disaster or even if you were to lose a job and buying food becomes more difficult for you for a while. So you can go ahead and buy your food, use your new canning skills and put it up so that it's shelf stable and know that your family's food future is much more secure. And most of the time buying in bulk saves you money anyways mm -hmm. if, if you can do it. So if you're prepared to buy in bulk 
in the long run it's going to save you a, a quite a bit of cash and the last thing when we talk about if we were going to start homesteading now um, and we didn't live out in the country yet is introducing non-noisy or small livestock if you have just a little bit of space mm -hmm. you can do the three that really pop out quickly are chickens i'd say quail and rabbits Chickens can kind of be loud, but quail and rabbits are pretty quiet. Uh, all three of those animals are really small. They're really cheap to start out with. You can, you can basically build your own structure for them if you'd like to. You can also buy something that's nice, but you can build something really cheap with scrap materials. You can get chicks that are babies really cheap for just a few bucks. You could buy some adults as well, and they're not going to break the bank. If you get hens, uh, that you're not going to have the crowing or anything of a rooster and you're going to get production pretty quick out of all three of those animals and you're going to have even if you only have a few chickens you know three or four you might be like oh, that's not really enough eggs for my family but you're learning the skills and you're getting started on your journey and that's really that's worth a lot mm -hmm. and both animals or all three animals you'll get things for your garden like fertilizer uh, so you're kind of learning like Laura said and what we've been saying you're kind of learning how to homestead and do all these things uh, as you go in, in small steps all of those things just to show you you know don't be discouraged watching homestead channels where they have 40 acres and cattle and feel like I'm never going to get there there's nothing I can do I can't start doing that gosh I wish I was a homesteader you can do so much where you're at right now get started tomorrow and one step at a time you're gonna get where you want to go mm -hmm. all right phase two as we're calling it so let's say you've either cut down your budget and put your money into investing into your future or maybe you're somewhere right now where you actually have money that you're ready to invest if we were going to start over in 2022 picking it up and moving out to our homestead property what would we do differently what would we keep the same well, I think the number one tip that we would tell people, that we give people, is to buy enough land that you can manage. Some people are going to be able to afford a lot of property, be able to get the truck, the tractor, the skid loader, all the all the equipment that you're going to need to manage a big, big property. Other people are only going to be able to afford maybe an acre or two, and you're not going to have to have a truck or a big tractor to be able to take care and manage that property. I think that's kind of the maybe the biggest mistake we made so we bought 10 acres and i love all 10 acres but we cannot manage 10 acres and i feel like we're a bit of a nuisance to our neighbors because we don't have a tractor to keep the fields that are vacant from animals mowed and, down when we don't have the fencing for it either so i think so, if we had the fencing it would help but if we, we could do it again on our budget I would say we talked about this we would probably only we would not buy more than three acres mm -hmm. that's kind of what we use so we have several garden areas we have fruit trees fruit bushes or berry bushes we have dairy goats and we have chickens and ducks and we we probably have that all on what an acre and a half I'd say two acres or two acres yeah. so if we had three acres we would still feel like we had extra space maybe to add one more thing 10 acres again like we love the space we love that we can't see our neighbors and those things are great but we did not plan on the on how much work it is to manage that much land i will say too if you do ever get property you will be amazed how much you can do on like just one acre you think man that's just an acre like that is a huge massive garden don't if, you if have you... a book that you liked about the one acre homestead probably i know that we have a book upstairs because I've looked through it. It's really neat about the small, I think it might be called the One Acre Homestead. I'll link it below. I've looked through it and gleaned some ideas from it. I cannot remember the title right now. But there, like you said, there's a lot you can do on a little bit of land. And we did talk about too, we would buy less land and then if we ever decided we wanted more for say cows, mm -hmm. we would look at just renting pasture from a farmer who's got more pasture than he knows what to do with, which where we live is very common. I think, uh, I do think renting land for your cows or your horses or whatever it is you're gonna, you're going to get is very smart because it's, it's gonna save you money in the long run. Land is very, very expensive and you're not stuck with it. If something happens and uh, you decide to get rid of your cows or wh whatever it is you have, uh, you're not stuck with the land. Somebody else owns that and, uh, you, you know, you're just back to your one or two acres. 
All right, the next thing we would do after we bought the land is we would be smarter about creating an infrastructure, especially water plan, before getting into having animals. Because uh, I'll link it below. We have a video about all the dumb choices we made about how we <laughs> set up our homestead, and now we're trying to fix it. But we just didn't think big picture enough, especially with infrastructure. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree with that. We did start small, and that's a it's a really cheap way to go. But if you wanna, if you know you're going to want more chickens or more goats or whatever it is, you need to think big picture. And I do wish we had like a nice big barn and a nice big chicken coop. Uh, I'm thankful for what we have, but if we were planning for the future, that's what we would do. One thing that I think that we've done well that I would continue to do is to vary the garden. Growing crops is really important important I feel like to the homestead mm -hmm. lifestyle. It produces a lot of food for you and a lot of sustainability for the earth um, but it's really dangerous to put all your eggs in one basket to do one type of gardening I feel like because you know if you have a beautiful huge row garden and then it's an extra wet spring you could get into big trouble. If you have everything in vertical tower gardens and then a tornado comes through or, you know and or just a really strong windstorm and blows everything over well then you're in really big trouble. So we here, we have two DIY greenhouses. Um, they cost us about $200, is that right? Yeah, it's a, I mean, they were first- But that was- We were first used them as chicken, as chicken <laughs> houses, so. They'd probably be more expensive today. They're very multi-purpose. Not much more expensive, mm -hmm. but they grow an incredible amount of food. Um, and I'll link that below too, if you wanna see how we did that. We also have, um, uh, tiny little apple orchard, berry bushes that are over far away from everything else. Um, we have a traditional row garden and we have some um, containered, uh, let's see, potatoes and tires. I have a tower garden mm -hmm. and I have, um, is that it? Does that sound so, right? Yeah. yeah, so it's just <clears throat> not everything's in the same place. It's varied on the types of things that I'm using. The idea is if something fails, not everything will fail. And that helps produce more security for your family. Uh, we've already mentioned this, but I would also, one of the first things I would do is to fence everything off really well. However, whatever type of fencing you want to, to use, uh, I'd get good fencing, not, not something that's temporary, and I'd, I'd fence off the whole farm, everything that I know I'm gonna use for animals or for gardening. It'll save you a lot of headaches in the long run. Some people like to go for electric fence, and you can put in a, a high quality electric fence around your whole farm. Other people like the, the field fence. Uh, they both have pros and cons when you weigh it out. It will cost you a chunk of change to, to put it up, even if you do it by yourself. It's a, it's a big time and money thing, but you will be so glad and happy that you did in the long run. And I would make sure that when you are choosing your fencing material, that you either test it out with your animals or get advice from somebody that you know personally and trust because we went through so many fencing structures trying to keep our goats in i think it was mostly user <laughs> error if i'm if You're i'm being, being really honest. honest but go to somebody's farm and see how they keep their animals in the animals right. that you want to raise uh, somebody that's doing it uh, kind of along the lines of what you're thinking go there uh, Make make friends with somebody ask them questions. What do you like about your friends? What do you not like? How easy is it to mm -hmm. maintain? Uh, what was the cost of, of putting it up things like that and uh, you can kind of figure out once you talk to somebody whether it's something that's going to work for you and your farm or not in the other and get, kind of finish it up here, the last thing I feel like we did really well and I would encourage other people to do is to have backups for your electric or gas run things on your homestead. Unless you're planning on going totally off grid, mm -hmm. most people who homestead do want the convenience of electricity. Um, we've talked before about being off grid and we've tried a lot of we've things. We've dabbled in various Ice boxes to not having a hot water heater and you know having a hand pump shower. We decided that we that the amount of time it took us to do those things took away from our family time, and we prefer to have to continue to have electricity and be on the grid. But we are prepared for eventualities where we lose power because it happens a lot in the country, or even you know if there were to be a economic or mm -hmm. natural disaster where electricity wouldn't be readily available, that we can still pump water from our well 
that we can still heat our house with, you know, we have a wood stove, we can still cook on our wood stove. So um, we have backups for those systems that we are not in control of where the energy comes from. That's another one of those where it does take some prior planning. It might take a little bit of money initially to put some of those systems in place, but uh, the peace of mind is worth it, I think. I think so, I agree with you. All right, so to put a cap on this, to end it up, if you had to give somebody one or two sentences of advice about starting their homestead in 2022, what would it be? I would first say uh, to prepare, do all of your research, know as much as you can uh, what you're getting into, and then two is just do it. Don't be afraid. Don't be don't be scared. Uh, once you've done a research and you know what you're getting yourself into, then go for it. Okay. I would say um, two things. Number one, start tomorrow. Whatever you can do where you're at now, start it because you will spend the rest of your life waiting to have enough money mm. or you know time, time or, or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and number two, be true to yourself as well. Um, what homesteading looks like is different for everybody. If you are somebody that hates mourning with a passion, you are probably not going to be a dairy farmer. And be true to yourself for the fact that you would probably be miserable raising milk cows, you know, things like that. You know, look at who you are, what's your personality like, where are you going to enjoy and be successful and work on those skills and grow your homestead in that direction. As Don't you go try along. to be somebody yeah. else. As you go along, you'll figure that out too. Things yeah. that work for you and the things, things that, that don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think that's it. Again, thank you to the Squeaky Tree Homestead for inviting us to join everybody on this collaboration. Please take a moment to check out the awesome channels below. There's quite a variety of uh, channels and how their homesteads are set up. You are going to learn a lot from all of them and I'm sure all the videos are going to be just crazy different and give you great ideas. Thanks so much for watching guys and we will see you soon. Thanks for watching.